Well, good morning, everybody. Oh, it looks like my lights are down a little bit back here. How's it going out there? How is everybody today? Let's get the lights on properly. And hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be. And welcome to the party. Hey, I'm Photo Joseph, just in case you've stumbled upon this and have no idea who I am or why you're here. Um, and today we're going to talk about the brand new Knit Collection version 4 because it was just released this morning, just a few short hours ago. Let's see, three hours by my math. And um, I've been working with it for a while. I've been showing it off to the DxO media as part of their press run, which is really exciting, which basically means that DxO asks me to go along on their virtual press tour. Obviously, nobody does press tours in person anymore on their virtual press tour. And I got to show off this software to, I think we hit over 100 journalists this time, which is uh, which is pretty fun and cool. Anyway, let's give it a quick little shout out. Say hello, say good morning, say greetings in the chat wherever you might be. We're actually streaming to a bunch of different places right now out to, um, we're on my regular YouTube channel, which if you're not there, that's probably the best place to see this, youtube.com slash photojosephlive. That is the new channel. And of course, I'm also streaming out to Facebook and Twitch and a whole bunch of other places. But uh, but let me just start by getting the comments up and let's see what is happening out here today. Starting with Mr. Darren Land in Clovis, California. Good morning to you. Always, always good to have familiar names and faces on here. Good morning from uh, West Virginia. I had to think about that for like a quarter of a second there. Uh, greetings to you. Good evening to you as well. We got just a few people in the chat this morning. I know this is an odd time. I don't usually go live on Wednesday mornings. Usually it's Tuesday morning at 10 or Wednesday evening at 9. And now I threw everybody for a loop and did a Wednesday morning at 9. But that's just that's just the way it's going today. So um, yeah, what I want to know, first of all, let me know those of you who are watching live. Um, have you seen the demo yet? Did you see the demo that I released at 6 a.m. bright and early this morning? And uh, if you saw that, got any questions to follow up on that? And if anybody has not seen it yet, I can just kind of go through the top on the go from the top on this thing and give people a little bit of a tour of what this uh, what this experience looks like. I don't want to do the same demo here that I did in that video because you can go watch that video. I'd rather dive into other directions on it, but but let's just see what we've got, what's happening out there. I'm going to just quickly check my stats and make sure that everything is looking good. It does appear to be so. We are streaming. We're getting good numbers everywhere. I want to check my my off YouTube chat. Oh, I got to bring up the chat for that. I forgot about that. Uh, where do I find that chat for the non YouTube? And in the meantime, here we go. In the meantime, tell me what you're all are up to. I want to know. I want to know. Are you excited about this new system? Are you excited about this new update to the Knit collection? It is definitely a nice little upgrade. There's some really cool features in here. So I want to know what you guys think of it. Um, oh, you were in office hours this morning. Um, Amari was in office hours. So office hours, for those of you who don't know, is this thing that Alex Lindsay puts together, which is this like, really awesome, really impressive mind meld of people from all over the world talking about all kinds of tech. It was kind of one of these, like, let's just start this thing during the COVID lockdown. And it grew into something much bigger. And it's uh, it's very organized. It's very impressive. I can pretty much never attend because it's right in the morning during the get the kid and the house ready for school and work and breakfast and lunches and all the stuff. So I just I never get to be there, which is really disappointing. I've I've kind of rearranged everything to be on a couple of times, but but that's about it. So um, which is always a bummer to miss that because it is very very impressive. So let's just let's just give a little bit of an overview of what this is. Um, I am not seeing questions come in about it yet, which is fair enough because it has just launched. But let's just talk very briefly about what it is. So just in case anybody is not familiar with the Knit Collection and what that is in general, which would be hard to imagine if you're a Photoshop user, if you've been doing still photography for any amount of time, you've probably heard of the Knit Collection. But just to set the, the groundwork here, the Knit Collection dates back 25 years. <laughs> it's a bit old. It's a lot older than probably a lot of viewers today. Um, it is a 25 year old originating piece of software. And this company that uh, originally came up with it was called Nick Software. And they were, they released the Nick, Nick, well, originally it wasn't even the Nick collection. It was just individual Nick filters. Gosh, I don't remember which one was first, but it would have probably would have been either Viveza or Color Effects Pro or Silver Effects Pro. Those were kind of the key ones. And back in the day, you used to buy them individually. And I want to say they were like $150 a piece. And this is the late 90s. So that's probably quite a bit more in today's dollars. So that's how they used to be. And then at some point they bundled it. And then at some point Google bought it. And when Google bought it, they sold the whole bundle for quite a lot less. I want to say they sold the whole bundle for $150. And they did that for a little while. And then, and then Google decided to just give it away for free. 
And the thing was that Google was not updating it. They, they never updated it at all. They extracted code from it. If you ever played with Snapseed, they basically took a bunch of tech out of Nick Collection and put it into Snapseed. And I think they put some stuff in Google Photos as well. I was never a Google Photos user, but that seems to sound vaguely familiar. And, um, and it was, so they made Snapseed, which is a really, really awesome iOS app. I, I still, it's, I don't use it that often anymore, to be honest, but it was very, very impressive, very cool. And it was definitely Nick. You get those, you know, the whole control points, you points, all that stuff, it was there. So that was really cool. But they didn't develop it. They didn't upgrade the Nick collection itself. And then in 2017, if I got my numbers right, DxO Labs, a company, software company out of Paris, France, bought the collection from Google. And now it's in their very capable hands. And over the last couple of years, they've been updating UIs. They've been cleaning up some code. They've been doing bug fixes. They've been making new presets, doing a lot of little things. But this release is the beginning of a whole new era where they are rewriting the filters from scratch. And the first two that have been completely rewritten are Viveza and the Silver Effects Pro filter. So these are brand new code from the ground up. Uh, they look very familiar. They have the same layout. There is a new UI. Uh, we'll take a look at that in a second, but it will feel, look and feel very familiar, but they have now been able to add a lot of capability to it, which is really, really cool. So that's kind of the, the back end story of the Nick collection and where that came from. Um, let me, uh, let's just go back up here real quick to the chat comments again. We said Darren saying, uh, current DxO user are looking forward to seeing the new Nick features. Awesome. So we will, we'll definitely get into those in a moment here. And Don says, um, hi from Arizona, didn't get a chance to see your announcement. So yeah, the, the video, I'm going to not do the same demo that I did in the video this morning because, you know, I want you guys to go watch that as well. And that's more of a very comprehensive, this is everything that's new. And that video is the actual demo that I did for the media over the last month or so when we we're doing all these press meetings. So that's that demo. Um, today we'll do a little bit more casual, a little more playing around and just kind of show you a few different things. So um, so with that said, let me set something up here. I, I kind of was scrambling before this and I didn't get everything quite set up. Um, and in fact, you know, what I'm gonna do as well is I'm gonna open a different picture that I've been working with just because I wanna work with something different. Um, oh, I know, yeah, I'll do this one because this was working. I had, this was a photo that I had kind of prepared for, let's see here, let's go ahead and switch over to the, ooh, whoops, let's, we're gonna have to fix something there. Um, I'm gonna show you a photo that I had prepared for a demo, but then we ended up not using, but I think it still works really well, really well. Uh, give me just a moment, figure out where that screen setting is, get the right screen set up, there we go, now this should go full screen, there she is. All right, I guess I could also do that. I, there we go, gotta find the right standing position if I'm going to, uh, going to do this. By the way, it's a Wednesday morning. My kid is in here. Um, you might hear him in the background. He might come storming in at some point. You just, you never know with kids. It's kindergarten from the studio day. All right. So you're looking at this picture here. This is, I'm in Lightroom right now. Um, oh, that's the, that's actually, that's the Lightroom CC, which doesn't work, but I'm going because they still don't support plugins, um, which is just kind of frustrating. I'm going to export the original of this so that I can open this in Photoshop and just show you a totally straight Photoshop workflow. So let me just stick this on the desktop real quick. Um, yeah, it is such a bummer to me that Lightroom CC, which I do personally use, still does not support plugins, which is just killing me. So Lightroom Classic has full support for plugins. Obviously, Photoshop has full support for plugins. But Lightroom CC still does not. Man, that's such a bummer. I just, oh, I'm really, come on, Adobe, give me, give me my plugins. Uh, all right, but I want to show this to you today through Photoshop. And so there's the photo I was playing with for the thumbnails. Let's just... Um, Let's just go a new photo up here. Open up the, um, where did, 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 where'd it go? Well, there's the, there's the XMP file. There's the original. There's what I want. Okay. So we're just opening up the base raw file here. So because it's a raw file, it's now open in ACR on another computer screen. Let's get this over here. Um, because it's raw file, of course, it's opening into Adobe Camera Raw and you have different ways that you can work within Photoshop with your filters, with the Nick filters. You can either open the picture, I would say normally, where it, once it processes through ACR, it becomes pixels. And then any change that you make to it is permanent. But personally, I prefer to work, and it does make for bigger file sizes, but and it's a bit slower, but I prefer to work with smart objects as much as possible. So what that means, if you're unfamiliar, is that the... Once I open this photo in Photoshop, it will not be pixels. It will be a container showing me the inside of that container, which will still be a raw file. And any filter effects that I do to that smart object 
will be uh, considered smart filters. So those filters will be able to be re-editable infinitely. God, I just realized I'm totally off center. Editable infinite, infinite, in, infinite forever. And um, you can even go inside of the container and re-edit the raw source. So that's what I'm gonna actually do here. So starting off with this raw file, I, what I usually like to do is just like an auto adjust inside of Photoshop, let it, uh, just let it kind of do what it does, balance out the levels and so on. And then instead of clicking open, I click down here and choose open as object. I think you can also, yeah, uh, no, hold option, no, option, alt, control. It used to be you had to op hold on the option key, but I guess they changed that. So, oh, there we go, option, wait, option, command, no, option, shift, command, option, command, shift, gives you open object. Dear Lord, why do they change these shortcuts? Or right click, I, I just click on the triangle and choose open as object, there we go. So now what we're looking at is the smart object. And the cool thing about this, you can see the little icon there tells me it's a smart object. If I open this, I go back into the raw level and you can see all the adjustments that I hit, did here are still there. So there's that's where we're gonna start. And again, that's gonna allow me to work with this as a, uh, as a smart filter on this smart object. Good Lord child, there's my kids screaming out there. <laughs> it's locking out. Um, so here we've got the Nick Collection Selective Tool Palette, which comes up on the left. It's funny because if you use Nick Collection previously, if you use the Nick version like one and two, the that floating palette was probably about the first thing that you went close and got rid of because you didn't want to see it. It's actually now quite a bit more useful and it looks a lot nicer. If you've closed it and you can't find it, if you go to the file menu and then go to automate, you'll find it here, Nick Selective Tool. And that's how you reopen that, um, that little guy. So we've got that up here. And from here, we can access all of our filters. So just real quick, you've got, um, some of these have presets where you can little click a little triangle down and you can look at some different filter. Oh, I guess I don't have any added in here, but you can you can add presets um, that are favorites. So any of your favorite presets show up in here. So the one click access without having to jump into the tool. And that's actually new as of the previous version. Um, and then there's also, as you can see, there's that last edit. So whatever I did last, will just get automatically applied here. If we scroll down more, there's something called meta presets. We'll come to those. That's a whole new thing. But I want to jump into Viveza, which is one of the new and totally uh, totally redesigned, uh, rewritten, I should say, tools. Uh, let me do a quick, I'm going to jump out of here momentarily here. I want to take a quick look over at the chat, see if there's anything that I'm missing here. Uh, does not look to be so. I'll look at the other chat. Nope, we're all good to go. So once again, if you're watching anywhere other than in YouTube, uh, you're obviously welcome to watch there. But the main channel where the chat is all involved is over at youtube.com slash photojoseph live. That is the new live only channel. And uh, do please be sure to subscribe over there. I would appreciate that. Trying to get those numbers up on that brand new channel, which is always a challenge. Okay, back to this. So this is Viveza. It will feel familiar. All of the, the layout in here is the same. Our presets are on the left, compare and zoom buttons on the top, and then all of our adjustments over here on the right hand side. And we can just start by, you know, clicking any old preset to give that a try and let that render out and see what that looks like. Or I'm going to go back to neutral, which is also a reset. Or we can just start adjusting these on our own. And you see here we have global adjustments. So the whole thing in Viveza is that you have both global and local adjustments. Global, of course, meaning that whatever I'm doing in here, like let's say I, I want to cool this image down a little bit, um, is going to be affecting the entire image. Whereas the local adjustments, which is where this thing gets really, really cool, is adjusting individual pieces of it. So that is that means you're using something called selective adjustments or control points, also known as U points. I don't actually know. An interesting bit of history trivia. I don't know if I know why they were called U points in the beginning. If anybody knows that, let me know in the chat. I I, I feel like that's something I know, but I completely can't remember. Huh. Anyway, so. Control points, U points, whatever you want to call them. The whole thing of a control point or U point is it builds a mask in real time. So let me just do this. I'm going to grab a control point and I'll just drop it anywhere on here. And then I'm going to enable the mask view, which is, it says control point one. If I click on there, we see the mask view and you can see the mask that is created. And the mask is based off of the chrominance and the luminance of wherever I drop it. So meaning the brightness values and the color values of wherever I drop it. So if I drop the U point on something that is bright green, it is going to create a mask off of things that are similarly bright and similarly green. And previously you didn't actually have the ability to refine that, but now you do. And this is one of the huge, huge improvements that's possible because of this whole rewrite of the Nick collection. 
again, starting with Viveza and SilverFX Pro, where you get these new functionalities. So here's how this works. So um, let me find, let's see, I'm gonna get out of the mask view. I want to find a particular part of the image. Uh, let's say, uh, let's say green, let me go in kind of close here. And let's say, maybe it's a little bit too close. Do like a two to one zoom here. Uh, let's say I want to select the green foliage here and make that more saturated and brighter. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna do. So I drop my control point and you don't have to turn on the mask, but I always like to turn on the mask so that I know exactly what I'm affecting, but that's up to you. And you turn on the mask and then you can drag it around, first of all, to figure out what area you wanna affect. So like I wanna affect the green foliage. That's the green foliage. If I position it there, that is not. So the white part of the mask is what will be affected. If it's pure white, it's affected 100%. If it's pure black, it's 0%. Any shade of green in between is some variance in between of affected to not affected. In this case, we can see that what I'm selecting is not the foliage. But if I drag this over like so, let's get that look kind of say right about. Mm, sometimes, you know, it's on a fine detail image. Just you know, wiggle it around a little bit, find the right spot. I'm going to say that's pretty close right there. I might move it again later, but but that's got the foliage. But we can see that there's a lot of other stuff selected as well. And in the past, you did not have an ability to refine this. You could use what we came to call negative control points, where you'd add a control point to an area you didn't want to affect and not affect that one. It's quite convoluted. It works, but a little convoluted. But now we can actually refine the control point. So as I scroll down here, you'll see, where are we? Here we go. Color selectivity. There's two sliders, luminance and chrominance. And as I drag these up, what I'm doing is restricting the amount of kind of the range of luminous values, so brightness values or chrominous values, color values of what is being selected. So if, imagine it like this, if you will. Let's just say that um, if you were looking at the color wheel is an easier one to think of because color wheel is a, a, a wheel. And we dropped it, like I said, on something green, right? So green on the color wheel is, let's say here. But of course, there's this is kind of green and that's kind of green. So there's a range of green. And so when you first drop a control point, it selects, let's just say, a slice of green that's like this. And anything that's in that range is going to get selected. By expanding that, you're saying, give me more stuff that's more uh, more of the color wheel, less just like green. I guess that makes sense. Um, and if you go the other direction towards 100%, then it constricts it and it makes it more narrow. So you're getting things that are just very close to that original green source. And the same thing with, a, uh, with luminance. If you do a black to white band, it would start by wherever on that band you select it, it would be a range of that as you expand or drop the percentage towards towards zero, it expands out to get more of that range. And as you bring it up closer to 100, it constricts to give less of that range. So that's what you're doing, you're constricting or expanding the range of luminance and chrominance values that are building up the mask. So with that said, here, as I bring up the chrominance and the luminance on here, you can see how I can very accurately select just very specific parts of the trees in here. So like there, let's just do that. That might be a little bit too restrictive, but I'll, I'll do it there to start. And then I'm just gonna take the saturation and like crank it way up on there. And so here you can see, let's do a little bit of brightness as well. So you can see there how just those parts of the leaves are being affected. Now, depending of course on your image and what you're doing to it, you may decide after you've done the mask that you wanna expand it a little bit more. Like let's say that I really wanted it this green and, and bright. Um, which is a bit much, but let me go to one-to-one -one and let's see. I mean, it's actually very, very clean in there. It actually looks very believable, but you might also decide, you know, let me just back off the range a little bit. And you don't have to be looking at the mask when you do it, um, but if you're looking at the mask, then that helps you to see exactly what is being selected. So there we go. So you have this like really nice control over what is or isn't being selected in there. Um, I'm going to jump over to the chat real quick just because a friend is saying hello in here. So first of all, we've got Johan saying, good evening from Belgium. Why, thank you, thank you. And Mr. Bug Bob, always good to see you, my friend. So uh, Southern California arriving late. I mean, really? We got nothing better to do than hang out and watch my shows? I mean, come on, man. Um, good to see you here. So uh, you may have missed the beginning. I don't know if you saw Bob. Let me know if you saw the demo that I released, the video I released at 6 a.m. But I am just going through the new features here right now of the Nick collection. All right. So that said, let's get back into this. And I really do need to reposition that, that circle, don't I? And... Um, where was I? Okay, so I've just added a single control point to select those leaves. So let me zoom back out of here. And you can see there the full result. And if I do a little before and after, you can see how it's brightened up just those parts of the green leaves. So that's the first kind of major, major thing, the ability to adjust the range of those control points. 
Uh, another big new feature in here is the ability to rename control points. So right here, you see this control point, or am I covering it? Let's just get rid of me. Here it says control point one. I'm going to just click on that and say green leaves. And now I have named that as green leaves. And so I'll know which one that is. And I know what that's meant for. Uh, let's see here. Let's do, let me do another one just to kind of build up the story of this a little bit. So I will zoom in, zoom in again, and let's go to a different part of the image. And I don't know, let's try just kind of a red over here. Yeah, let's try, let's do the red. Let's do the red leaves next. I'm going to do the same idea, grab a new control point, drop it on the red. Once again, I am going to enable the mask view so I can see exactly what I'm selecting. It looks like I got a pretty good spot there to begin with. Um, and actually, the way that's set, that's pretty good. It's not getting too much more than the red. But once again, I can, of course, expand or contract that. Now, here's another cool thing about this is I can, like I said, you can, as I go this way, let me go the opposite direction. I'll take these all the way up to 100, and you end up with this really, really precise mask. If I go the other direction, it gets bigger and bigger. But watch what happens if I take both of these to zero. We now have a normal radial gradient mask, which is not something we've ever had before in the Knit Collection, which is actually really, really cool. So you sometimes you don't want a mask. Sometimes you just want to have an effect that's over a general area. Like maybe you're doing kind of a dodging burning type of a thing inside of a Vesa and you just want to darken an area. You don't need a mask. You just want a general soft darkening brush, effectively. It's not a brush, but you know what I mean. Um, you couldn't do that before. And now you can, which is great. So love that. But let's focus on making this refined over that red. So like I said, in the beginning, it was actually pretty good. So let's just kind of leave it right about like so. Um, I'm going to rename this one Red Leaves. Red Leaves. There we go. And hide that mask. And I don't know what I want to do with this. Um, maybe same thing to kind of take the saturation up a little bit of that red. Uh, maybe I'll darken these. Let's go the other direction. So I'll darken these red leaves. So I brightened and saturated the other ones. And this is getting a little ridiculous in there. Um, let's go a little bit closer here. It might be a bit overdone. I think this picture might actually be a little bit out of focus, which is brilliant for me choosing that one. Um, no, that's that's actually pretty good. I think that's quite believable like that. Yeah, I, we're going we're gonna to leave it like that. Okay, so let's zoom back out and do a compare again. So now we're affecting both the red and the green. And now here's the next really cool thing is when I save this as a preset, I can now save a, a preset with the control points, which you could actually do before, but you had to know the combination. I always forgot what it was. I think it was you held down the option key when you click save. But every time I did it, I had to test it first to make sure I got it right. Anyway, now when I click on save preset, it says enter a name for a new preset. We'll just call this, uh, we'll call this um, fall leaves. And there's a button here that says save with control points. Yeah, so I click on save and it has now saved that with control points, which is huge. So I'm gonna go ahead and apply this. And then what I'm going to do is um, I'm gonna turn this off for just a moment. And I'm going to go back into my library and find another similar photo and um, export that out. And then I'm going to use the this preset on another photo. And um, just to oops, just to so this is what I want to do. I have no idea what's going to show up next in my library. Um, just to show you how this works on a different picture. So I guess that one will work. Sure. Is that raw? Uh, that is raw. Okay, I'm going to export. Here we go. We can go back now. Uh, this is we are in Lightroom of the Knit Collection. Selective tool is floating on top of that. Bravo, Photoshop. Um, that is very cold looking. That's interesting. Anyway, let's just export this as well. Export, um, let's do it like this. Export, export, where do we go? Export one photo as original. Now this is, you don't have to go through this kind of workflow. It's just again, because I'm in Lightroom CC, not Lightroom Classic, I do. Uh, but I'm just exporting out the base raw file. Now you can open a photo from Lightroom CC into Photoshop, but it doesn't open as a smart object, which is still like, come on, Adobe, you're killing me here. If you're not going to give me plugin support, at least give me the ability to open a photo as a smart object in Photoshop. Like it's the one thing I've been asking for for years. Come on, you guys, I need it. Um, anyway, all right, let's go back over to Photoshop. I'm going to open that new photo which, uh, great, which one was it? Must be this one. And that's gonna open into ACR, yep, there we go. Let's do an auto on that. Um, that's pretty dark. I'm gonna actually brighten up the shadows a bit more. I should brighten up the whole thing a bit. And here's what I'll do. I'm gonna brighten that up. I'm going to take a linear gradient, and drop that down just to drop the top half of that down a little bit. There we go, that's a little bit better. 
And this is one cold image, so let's warm things up a little bit. Oop, not as part of that, though. Let's go to the main image and warm this whole thing up a bit. There we go. Now it's kind of looking similar as to the other one. Now I'm going to go ahead and open that as a smart object as well. And once this is open, we're going to jump into that filter and uh, into the same filter into Vuvesa and apply the preset. So um, there's the new, that's the one we already did. Okay, there's the new one there. All right, so now I jump into Vuvesa. It does look like a very similar layout. Probably should have chose something a bit different, but that's okay. And open this guy up. And then I scroll to my presets. So here's my custom presets. And I click on fall leaves. And now I can identify the individual control points that I had done before. They're here by name. So obviously there's only two here, but if you had dozens of these, you know, having the names would be very, very handy. And I can say, oh, that one belongs on the green leaves. So let's zoom in nice and close on this. Maybe not that close. Let's zoom in nice and close on this. And, and let's pan that down. And I'm going to switch on the mask view and there see perfect and it's not the same photo um this mask that belongs on the green leaves is not quite hitting it right so now i just need to move that around a little bit and get it so that it is on the green leaves and then i'll have the same effect of the green brightening as i had on the other one and i think for this particular photo i'm probably going to expand that mask a little bit let's uh let's re let's drop these down get a little bit more of that in there there we go and now we should have that nice green yeah we can already see that nice green brightening effect that is happening on some of those. I might want to expand it even more just to get a little bit more of that in there. And then the same thing with the red. Let's scroll up to the red and let's see if that happened to land exactly in the right spot. Pretty close, pretty close, but we'll move this around a little bit. Again, get that into a better position for there. Maybe again, expand that out a little bit more, get a little bit more of that red as a part of it and digging that. Okay, we're good. Close that. And now we've got that red on there. So now as we zoom out to see the whole thing, we have there's our before and after of that. And yeah, that's pretty slick, right? So now I can apply that and we're going to have this effect rendered back in pretty, pretty slick. All right. Let me, uh, let me jump back over to the comments real quick because Mr. Bob is, uh, is, is chatting away over here. Let's just see what he's got to say. Uh, you did catch the review. Excellent. Adjusting individual control points and grouping and naming them is brilliant. It really is. So the grouping is not new. You actually had the ability to group before, but renaming is huge. Um, and then of course the ability to, to, change what the control point is selecting. Absolutely, absolutely massive. I'm um, gonna hope you would bring up that high key upper region down. Cottonwood leaves are so shiny. Oh, is that what that is? Uh, there we go. Yeah, brought that down a little bit. Probably could have done a little bit more, but but uh, you get the idea. Now to go back to the whole thing about, um, about being a smart filter and a smart object. So this has now been applied. There is Viveza as a smart filter. I can double click on this and go back into the Viveza app and, see, and it really is an app. It, these are, they think of these as apps that work as plugins. It's really what they are because they're so robust. Um, and I could go in and I can make a change on here. So I go, well, you know what, I, that green was a little bit too much. Or, you know, what, actually let's just expand the range of the green. Let's do that. So it's a little bit more broad as to what it's selecting. We can, uh, we can broaden that out a little bit. There we go, getting a bit more of that green in there. And it's probably a little bit too fluorescent. So I think I'll take that saturation down a touch. I say, okay, I like that. So I hit apply and now it's going to re-render that on top of the smart object. We're not, we're not kind of changing pixels and changing them again. Every time you make a change, it re-renders from the base, even to the point where I could go into the raw source. So here's that raw source. Let's open this. It goes back into ACR. And let's say in here, let me take some of the shiny down of this part of the scene. Um, let's do, let's do it like this. Actually, it's, it might be a bit much. Uh, let's see here. It's but maybe make that really big and soft. And that probably helps actually, that's pretty good there. I'll leave it like that. It's not perfect, but fine. And then I hit okay on there and that's gonna re-render back into Photoshop and re-render. This is why things take longer because everything gets re-rendered every time. Re-renders back with that Vuvez on top of it and you end up with, there we go, the new results of that. Okay, that was a bit dark in the back, but you, you see the idea of what we're doing. So that's kind of one of the big, huge things in there. Um, another fun one, um, but Bob is asking, when you're in Vivesa, does the app treat the image as a smart object? If it is a smart object, then it treats it as a smart object and the filter becomes a smart filter. So if you're not working with raw, keep this in mind. Let's just say that you've got a, um, let me find a, okay, here we go. I have a JPEG I'm going to open into Photoshop. So this is a thumbnail. It's just the thumbnail that I made, right? And right now, if I, oh, so I've opened this up. It is not a smart object, right? It is not raw. This started as a as a um, JPEG. 
If I add a filter on top of this, so let's go into Viveza and we'll do something wild here. So here we go, golden hour. I apply that on top and I hit apply. This is now rendered permanently into the pixels. Now what it does though, is it automatically duplicates that layer. So we still have my original one safe here, but that is a permanent application of that. If however, let's hide that. If however, I convert this to a smart object first, right click on it and choose convert to smart object. That doesn't make it raw, but it is a smart object now. So now if I go into one of these filters like Viveza and I'll do the exact same thing, I'll apply that same preset to it. That now gets rendered out as a smart object uh, as a smart filter, meaning that I can go, oh, you know what? That really isn't what I wanted to do. I can go back into Viveza and I can make any changes to it. So, um, oh, where'd we go? I, I think I just double clicked something too many times and oh, here it comes. And so I could say, oh, you know, I wanted to, I don't know, um, what did I do? Here, let's make the color temperature not quite as warm. So I dial that back down. And again, this is totally non-destructive. And that's only because this image has been turned into a smart object still not a raw file. It's not like it reconverts it to raw, but it is now a smart object, meaning that filters can be applied as smart filters. And this is a cool thing too. Let me get rid of this so we're not confusing the issue. Um, with this smart filter applied, it automatically builds a mask between them. So if I wanted to grab my brush and um, let's make my brush black. Oops, let's, no, wrong button there. Here we go, make my brush black. Now, as I brush over here, I am brushing a mask between these. And so you can see there's the mask that's being built. And you can see that we're affecting the mask between the smart object and the, um, uh, the smart filter. So which is really cool and exciting. So, so that's how that whole thing works. All right. So I hope that uh, hope that helps there. All right. Let's do um, let's do let's do what do we oh let's do meta presets next. Okay. So let me close this. Any other questions coming in? No other questions coming in. Again, you guys want to know anything specific? By all means, now is your chance. I'm here. We're live. Ask whatever you want. I will do as I can as Bob did, because Bob knows that this is his chance to get his questions answered. So there we go. Thank you for asking that question, even if it was a leading question. All right, let's do something else. I'm going to take, let's go back to this photo because I liked it better. I'm going to get rid of the smart filter. So we're back to my, oops, that was just the mask. Get rid of the smart filter. So we're back to the base image here. And now I'm going to apply a meta preset. So here's what a meta preset is. So I scroll down. These are a set of 10 predefined combination presets so that you have 10 different um, combo presets using multiple presets from the Knit collection, multiple filters at once. And since this is a smart object, everything will get applied as a smart filter. So let me do one that I have never tried before, expired film. Um, and by the way, when you're looking at these, there's a little question mark here, which uh, strange. Anyway, there's a little question mark here that tells you what this is supposed to look like. I'm gonna go ahead and just click on expired film and let it render that out. Um, Bob is asking if this will run an M1 Max, not natively. It is not native to M1 yet. So unfortunately, uh, it'll still run. It'll run in emulation, but it's not going to be native. Uh, okay, so right now it is rendering out two different plugins. I didn't even look to see which ones they are, but it looks like ColorFX. Ah, ColorFX and AnalogFX Pro have both been rendered onto this photo, giving us this combined result that it's still rendering the render progress bars off on another screen. That's why you don't see it. Um, that is giving us this combined effect of, what did it call it, old film or something like that. And it's loading textures now. The Analog Effects Pro is a, is a heavy one. That always takes time to process. There we go. There's the final result. Expired film, that's what it was. So there's what the expired film preset looks like. Um, oops, cancel. And let's go back to my hand tool, there we go. And so there's the result of that. You can see here that it is a combination of Analog Effects and Color Effects Pro. And of course, again, because this is a smart object, I could go in, at, actually, it looks really nice. I could go in at any time and change it. So I can say, you know, I want it to be, I don't know, something different. Let's do, let me zoom out on this. Let's go into ColorFX Pro and see what, what the results of that are. Now, keep in mind, okay, ColorFX Pro is opening on the other screen. Give me a moment here. Wait for it to load and then I can move it. Um, keep in mind that ColorFX Pro has not been rewritten. So this has the older UI to it. Um, it does not have the same new control point fancy features, but it does, of course, still work completely within the collection. So from here, I can see exactly what was done in color effects. So what we're seeing here is just color effects. What we're seeing here in Photoshop is color effects plus analog effects. So let's go back to here and I will, um, what do I want to do? Uh, let me make it brighter. Let's add a, another filter onto this and we'll do a, uh, let's see here. Let's do a brilliance and warmth and it'll take the saturation up on this just to super saturate that guy. 
that's pretty good. In fact, no, it does still have control points. So I'm going to bring the saturation up. Let's brag. Let's grab a control point and drop it onto the orange back there and drop the opacity of that back a little bit just so it's not quite as strong. Oops, I actually wanted to do a negative control point. Negative on there to protect some of this a little bit so it's not quite as saturated at the top there. There we go. I like that. So there's the change that I've just made. I'm digging that. Click OK. And now again, because it's all smart objects and smart filters, it all renders and it renders and it renders. Remember, I told you it does, does take longer when you use everything as smart objects, but I like it for the flexibility. And there's the end result of that. <laughs> Bob says, who knew expired film could look so good? I know, right? So so there's that. Anyway, this is a great, here's a great thing. Like this red, um, wait, wait, is it still, oh, still rendering. Render, this is not, I'm not looking at my primary screen, so everything keeps showing up in the corner of my primary screen over here. It's like, I keep forgetting. Anyway, um, let's go into this 100%. And like, that's a bit too much, right? So that's going to be kind of overdone. So I could go in and uh, figure out which one of these filters is doing that. Or I can go to my smart filter mask here. Let's bring up the brush tool. And I'm going to make this a very, very, very faint shade of black. Let's do like a very, just like a little bit, barely a bit of gray. And I'm going to start to kind of paint out some of that mask in there. So it's not quite as strong. Um, you know, I could continue to make it a little bit darker. And I could paint it like this. Or what I could do is actually, actually, there's a little trick here. I can, with the mask selected, I'll bring up the levels. And now with the levels on the mask, I can change how that is going to affect it. And we're not making much of a difference here, but there we go. Make how, make, uh, basically I'm changing the darkness level of that mask. Okay, we're getting into some silly advanced stuff here. But anyway, so that's how that whole thing works. So that's really cool. Love that, love that. Okay, uh, let's see here. What else do we want to do? Let's see here. We've got, we've got a little bit of time left. Um, Lightroom, let me jump into Lightroom and show you some stuff in there. So I guess I need to launch Lightroom Classic. There it is. And let's bring this over here. And um, just because I have these same photos in here, I'm going to start with the same photo, but I will do something different. Let's see. So let's start with this photo. Let's say that I want to apply some filters to this. So I go in and I say, edit this in. Let's do something different. Let's do, um, let's do, what do I want to do? I guess we'll do the same thing. We'll do Color Effects Pro. I'm going to go ahead and edit the oops edit a copy of this oh is that, that must be the tiff file let me just do a quick little reset here from recording my demo earlier let's get rid of all of these tiffs delete remove photos so i'm not getting confused as to what i'm looking at all right there we go that is the raw file i didn't delete the wrong thing yes that's the raw file okay i'm going to edit this in color effects pro edit a copy so it renders out a, um, a tiff file so now we're not going to be in smart object land right we are in TIFF land because Lightroom Classic is rendering this out as a TIFF file, which I can now apply an effect to. So I'll just grab one, some preset. Let's go to my recipes here and I'll grab like, um, let's do this Blue Monday. It's kind of cool looking. Great. And I'll apply this. So now I've applied, I'm rendering out Blue Monday into this TIFF. Okay, cool. Now let's go to that TIFF file and there it is. And let's add something else. I'll go in and let's say edit this one in. Um, I guess, I guess I'm going to use the same demo that I did in the video Analog Effects Pro and edit oops that must be the click on there we go let's get the right file the tiff file edit in analog effects pro and we're gonna edit the original so i'm editing that tiff file and i will do some kooky film effect which of course this is now opening on my other screen and as soon as part bug but here while that's rendering up let's see here mr bob said um do they serve coffee in tiff land they should i need coffee in tiff land I think if that's a joke, I'm totally missing it. Sorry, Bob. I do need another cup of coffee, though. That is for sure. Um, all right, here's Analog Effects Pro. Let's get this onto the screen here. And let's do something really dramatic. There we go. That's kind of that's kind of a bit much. We'll let that render out. And then here's the crazy cool thing. I will be able to copy and... I was going to do this one. There we go. I will be able to copy and paste both of these adjustments from one photo to another. Just pretty slick. So let's see, we're going to call, we'll call it, that's good. We're going to hit save on there. All right, so I save this and there we go. Okay, and that's done. So now I'm going to go in here and right click and choose export, copy and apply parameters. And then I go, let's copy that effect and copy the analog effects. Okay, and then I'll go to another photo. Let's go to this one here, right click and choose export, copy and apply parameters. And then I will apply these two effects. I'm going to apply Color Effects Pro first. It's going to have to render that out as a TIFF file. And then 
I will grab the TIFF file and apply the other filter on top of it, which will give us the combined effect of both of these filters on a whole new image, which is pretty darn cool. Love that, love that, love that. All right, that one's done. Let's take a look at that result. There's that one. And um, now we'll go in here and did I? I have a feeling like I pasted the wrong, whatever. Um, and let's go in here and paste, 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 paste. Where am I looking for? Export, copy and apply parameters. I will also point out um, that the, because that looked different, the software that I'm running with is a very early beta. I have not yet upgraded to the release version because, so if there's some weird bugs here, that's why, because I had a very meticulously planned step-by-step -step demo. Um, yeah, this looks totally different, doesn't it? That's funny. Um, very meticulous step-by-step -step demo that I didn't deviate from for the press. And once I was locked in on a version of the software, I just stuck with it. I didn't want to upgrade, you know, last thing you want to do is upgrade and find a new bug, um, upgrade to a new beta version. And so uh, anyway, so I, um, I, this is very old. This is very old beta actually, but there we go. So you get the idea. I don't know why that didn't, that totally did not work right. That's funny. I don't know what are you going to do? Like I said, early beta version. Anyway, all right, so uh, let's see here. Bob's got another question, and then we're going to wrap this thing up. There are, um, there are, Bob's the only one asking questions today. You guys, you make me feel unloved when you don't ask questions. Bob says, that was fast. Can we export the settings, then import them into another image, or does the target image need to be open? You're not, you can export the settings, but you save a preset, and then if you wanted to open that preset on another system, you can export the presets. But when you save it as a preset, you just open another photo and then apply the preset. So that's how that works. If you're asking about from the copy and paste, no, that you're basically copying into the clipboard and then pasting it on another image. And it could be to groups of images too. You can have multiple images selected when you do the paste of the effects. Uh, if you wanted to do it on a whole other system, you would have to save it as a preset and export the preset is how that would work. I hope that answers that question. Okay, um, I don't think there's anything else going on here. So very, very quiet in the chat today, except for Bob. Thank you, Bob, for showing up and asking all the good questions because somebody had to. But um, I hope you guys enjoyed that. I'm going to bail out of here because it is getting close to the end of the hour and um, and I definitely need me some coffee. So I hope you all are feeling good. I hope you're all having a good time and I hope you all enjoy this uh, little demo here. If you do decide to upgrade, I would appreciate using the links in my video. They're down below. Um, I hope I added it to this. Photojoseph.com slash Nick Collection will take you right to the purchase page where you can buy it or do your upgrade. Um, yeah, well, I guess we're going to leave it there. Darren says, good job. Well, thank you, Darren. I appreciate that. All right, guys, I'm out. Take care of yourselves. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.